everyone. I'm Lisa Danilchuk. I'm a licensed psychotherapist specializing in post-traumatic stress and complex trauma. And this season kicks off with Dissociation 101, what Huberman didn't tell you about PTSD. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the How We Can Heal podcast. I'm very excited to share season three with you. My name is Lisa Danilchuk. If we haven't met before, I'm a licensed psychotherapist specializing in complex trauma treatment. I'm also a graduate of Harvard University and UCLA, go Bruins. And last year, I served as president of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. So I was working all year with top clinicians and researchers around the world in the fields of trauma and dissociation. They are amazing. They have incredible work. A lot of people don't know about them. Some of them are a little, you know, more out there than others, but I'm telling you, it's gold. I've invited some of them into this season, onto season three of the How We Can Heal podcast. And there's a little bit of a story as to how and why they got here. I'm going to tell that in a moment. But I just want to underscore, this is gold. This is stuff where like, I went and lectured at Harvard. One of my old professors invited me back for a guest lecture. And my professor was like, wow, this is amazing information. Why don't we teach this here? So you're really getting something that... Most people who even go through psychological training programs, they don't get until after they graduate and they go do clinical work and they have a hard time with it and they find an organization like ISSTD and they go to conferences and then they meet these people. And I'm going to bring them directly to you this season. And so I'm hoping that will help, you know, just close a gap in terms of information. It takes a long time for information to get into textbooks. These are the people that write those textbooks. Okay, I'm not even joking. And so I feel super blessed to talk with all of them. They're also just amazing human beings because doing this work brings that out somehow. We have to reflect on ourselves and grow and be humbled multiple times in this work. And so they're really amazing human beings. I think you'll enjoy getting to know them. I know you'll appreciate some of their work. And there's so much more to dive into from where we start with this season. So Super excited to share it with you. And I also want to share how this season came about. So in what year are we? 2021, (laughs) I came into, we're in 2023. But in 2021, I've never actually been a big podcast listener. And I talked about this at the end of season two when Alex came on, um, my partner came on and interviewed me. We reflected on the two seasons of the How We Can Heal podcast, and you know he was a big part of planning that idea in my head that that I might want to do a podcast. I've never really been into podcasts, like hadn't really followed you know an episode here or there. Someone will send to me. I usually wouldn't finish it. <laughs> I'd like have it on my phone as a to do until I was like, okay, I gotta scratch that one because I'm not doing it. So in 2021, a dear friend and colleague, Carrie Awerko, who's also been on this podcast. Uh, She's a yoga teacher who focuses a lot on play and movement and and joy and just different ways to be embodied and is very well steeped and respected um, in the yoga world. She shared with me this podcast and said she was really loving it. It's a lot of science. It's a scientist out of uh, Stanford University and it's the Huberman Lab podcast. So I hopped on that train and I rode that train all of 2021 I was training for an Iron Man. Actually, I call it Iron Person anyway, but I was training for an Iron Person, a half Iron Person. And I was on my bike for, you know, at least an hour most days. I was, you know, running and sometimes in the water as well. So I was out and usually on my bike rides, I would have the time to listen to a full podcast. So with that training, I listened to every single episode throughout the year of 2021. Didn't miss a single one. So I don't know if any of you, maybe this is your podcast that you do that with. Maybe. I don't know if any of you have been that like dedicated where it's really a part of your life, right? You have this person in your ear. It's a beautiful thing. And so I started hearing Huberman, Andrew's his first name, saying that he wanted to do a, a podcast about PTSD or people were asking for that. Of course, right? We've been through so much collective trauma. There's so much trauma out there in the world in general that for a long time we haven't really spoken to. And I think we're just starting to build this more collective awareness of, oh, mental health challenges and PTSD, and let's talk about them. So I'm not surprised people were asking for that and that he wanted to deliver, right? 
And I had this little inkling in me (laughs) that was like, I think I know how this might go. I have a sense from having listened to the episodes that what he tends to do is review the research and then sort of present this is what the research says, you know, and it's not necessarily a prescription you're getting from someone, but it's information, right? There's a, a deep literature review and like a sense of this is the consensus that I'm seeing in the research is what he would share. And I know, cause I know the research and I know the practice and I know the people dealing with the hard problems. I was like, okay, so he's going to see some exposure therapies coming out really strong. And I really hope he doesn't say that's best practice or something along those lines, right? And I'll explain in a moment, but what tends to happen is people who experience dissociation as part of trauma, which is a lot of people, can actually be more triggered or even harmed by exposure practices that aren't dissociation informed. They're not inherently bad. It's just when we don't have this awareness of dissociation, uh, it's really easy for people to kind of not get the treatment they're they're needing and even get perhaps more dysregulated or more upset, like to have more problems in their lives as a result of, of seeking out these treatments. So I sent Dr. Huberman an email and I said, hey, heads up, this is my thought. Like you're going to do an episode on PTSD. You might be thinking this based on the research. There's a really easy explanation to sort of fill that gap and um, make sure we're including the people who have experienced the most horrific harm, because those are usually the people with complex trauma and PTSD. So there's an easy way to fill that gap. Here's a few names of researchers I think you would love. And I made a list, and I followed up like the next day with more people that came to mind. And these are the people I'm having on this season. Okay, because what happened was he responded and said, thanks so much. I don't know if he ever read or looked at their research. I get it, man. I get way more email than I can follow up on. I totally get it. Uh, But the episode came out and I listened on one of my bike rides. And I probably I'm not even kidding you. I probably cried at some point. I was so disappointed. I was so disappointed because it was exactly sort of what I was expecting, which is really common. Like you'll even hear this. I mean, this this person's a professor at Stanford. You'll even hear, hear this in training and in universities that people just miss this piece about dissociation, which happens with the most complex, challenging traumas, which we think aren't that common, but we'll talk in one of the episodes about the real prevalence of them. We also just want to be mindful that if we're giving out some sort of direction or advice or you know, gleaning something from the research that we're not continuing to neglect the folks who fall at the far ends of the spectrum in terms of being, having been harmed so profusely. So I was disappointed because I felt like the episode would be helpful for people who kind of needed it the least. People who maybe had, if this is in your, your language box, we might talk about it this season, but had low ACE scores, right? Like not a lot of adverse childhood experiences, people who had a high resilience score, people who had resources growing up, supports, relationships, places to go when there were problems. People who have that kind of steady, supported, psychological, cultural, familial, whatever base would tend to benefit more from what was presented in that episode. And I'll share a few clips so you can hear the little pieces that really stuck with me. Uh, But those are the people who are going to hear, oh, EMDR is helpful. Oh, telling your story is helpful. They'll go do it and they'll feel better. Those are people who maybe grew up in a healthy, happy home, experienced a single event trauma like a car accident or a natural disaster, or, you know, a single event that you can kind of constrain in time. Those recommendations are actually helpful for those folks. Now, when we talk about folks who don't have high ACE scores, you know, who've had a lot of adverse childhood experiences, who've grown up with neglect, who've grown up with physical, mental, emotional, social, sexual abuse, who've been exploited in any way, Those are the people who, if they're listening to that episode and they go, oh, I should tell my story, I should get EMDR. It's not that those things are inherently bad or wrong. It's just that they're so delicate. The more trauma, the more 
complex trauma, developmental trauma someone's been through. You really need someone, if you're going to go and dive into these experiences, you really need someone who can hold your hand and pace with you and know when and how to tell if those instruments, if those tools are of service, right? So I want to break all this down for you in today's episode and just spell out what's in my mind, right? (laughs) Crying on the bike, (laughs) like, why, Huberman? I loved your dog. You've done me wrong. (laughs) The sad thing is, like, I have mad respect for anyone running a podcast. That's a super successful podcast. I I give a shout out to Huberman for all he's put together. And, And I mean, I know from listening, like, he prepares, like, there's work, right? And I know from running a podcast, like, there's work, especially if you're putting it out weekly. Like, I'm not trying to be a hater, but maybe a little bit of a squeaky wheel in that we do need to pay attention to these things. I I stopped listening to the podcast after that. Like I was crestfallen. I was disappointed. And I I even tried because Carrie told me, Carrie Oworko told me he did one on play soon after that. And I was like, oh, I want to listen. But honestly, I kind of lost a sense of trust in the information because I felt like I was really leaning into it, you know, this information on exercise science or whatever. And then I started going, well, if I feel this way, who else is like really niche in a field and there's things that are missing? So kind of sadly, it broke that foundation of I'm really leaning into this information and applying it to me. I always listen with a grain of salt. Don't get me wrong. Anything about physiological, like exercise science and performance, I'm like, was this done on middle-aged women? Because if it was done on young men, it's a totally different story. So I'm always listening with a grain of salt, but I actually just couldn't, I really couldn't listen anymore after that. So it was sad. But I also just got fired up about sharing these people with you, sharing this information with you, and hopefully starting a conversation that leads towards collective individual healing that helps us sniff out pathways where we can find our own unique ways of healing from horrific, terrible things that I think we'd all agree we wish wouldn't happen to anyone, but they do. And we're left with the aftermath of them. So I want to back up a little because you might be just dropping into season three. We've talked in season one and two about trauma and dissociation and healing and movement and yoga and dance and play, all these beautiful things. We've had amazing researchers. We've had amazing clinicians incredible people on this show. And we have started to define dissociation, but it's something that it's important to come back to. So what is dissociation? (laughs) So a lot of people will say the word disassociate or disassociation because that's kind of, you know, how language works. In the clinical world, we use dissociation. And what we're talking about here on just a linguistic level is anytime something is differentiated. It's split apart. When we're talking about a mental health challenge or condition, or I would also say adaptation, right? Because this is usually a response to an experience or multiple experiences. When we're talking about dissociation in that context, there are a number of things that fold in. And this splitting, differentiating, separation is part of that. It's a big part of that. But I want to share that we're all, I think, at this point in time learning about trauma and and really interested in our nervous systems and in our brains um, and what happens when there's an emergency, when there's a crisis, when something traumatic is happening. And we're getting pretty good at understanding in general culture. I've heard it in songs and commercials, maybe not yet, but we're getting there probably, where we're aware of this fight or flight response, right? We're like, okay, something emergency happens. I get adrenaline and cortisol and my heart rate goes faster and I just feel strong and I I move into action, right? Most of us are pretty on board with that's a thing, right? Most of us have experienced that. Even if we're just in a car and we have to stop fast, we get that big, you know, rush of cortisol, adrenaline and, and this even tension in our bodies, this move towards action. What we haven't quite integrated is freeze. And we can even go into, I mean, I could go into a thousand definitions of different types of trauma. I could go into a thousand manifestations of what this looks like. But in a boiled down general sense, 
we also need to be aware of that freeze. Now, I want to differentiate, I think, about a soft freeze, which is there's a loud noise. What was that? Wait, am I okay? Am I safe? Was that somebody dropping a book or a gunshot? Very different scenarios, right? And if we go, oh, somebody dropped a book. Cool. The energy that kind of had us freeze for a second loosens up. And we might be a little extra aware for a moment if there's another book that's going to fall or another shoe that's going to drop or whatever, right? But we go about our day. It's done. A hard freeze is very different. And it's very common for people to get to this place, especially with physical and sexual assault and abuse. So we start with maybe a soft freeze, what's happening. And then if we go, oh, I'm not safe, we might run, we might fight. And then if that's not working, there's a tipping point. Sometimes we'll call this fright, right? Where it's like an oh shit moment. Oh shit. I'm trying to get to safety. This monster's chasing me down the street. I tried running. It's catching up to me. I'm trying to fight it. It's much bigger than me. And what our bodies tend to do there is they either start to flag really quickly and they'll usually drop into a hard freeze. We might call this tonic immobility. We might call this, you know, in terms of a polyvagal theory, dorsal vagal. I know that's a whole other conversation we're not going to get into today, but there's a lot of names for it. I just call it for simplicity's sake today, a hard freeze or a faint even. People will perhaps go unconscious, perhaps still be conscious, but body goes limp. This is a really deep brain response and decision, quote unquote. It's not that you're thinking, hmm, this monster is chasing me down the street and it seems pretty big and I don't think I could fight it. Maybe I could try, maybe not. It's not that you're in cognitive space here and it's not that you have the on or off switch consciously to go, let's freeze now or let's freeze in three seconds. Your body based on the way it's evolved, makes the judgment call, this is the best way to, to survive. This is the best way for me to make, make it through this, is to go limp, to go numb, and to not feel what's about to happen. Because if that monster is going to terrorize you and eat you with its sharp teeth, it's better if you don't feel it, right? So we go into this hard freeze. Like I said, some people faint. So there's different layers of consciousness. You might be very aware, but not able to move your body. You might not be aware at all. Some people get the sense, here comes dissociation, of a separation of their consciousness from their body. Like they're looking at it from the outside. They're watching it happen. They're not feeling it. They're not in it, but they're watching it. When we talk about dissociation, we're usually describing some experience now, I'm just using a monster running down the street because that's probably not going to happen. I don't want to, you know, I'm trying not to give stories that are going to overload you with more trauma because you get enough in the news, right? You get enough in life. But we can most of us imagine or have experienced something where we just body turned off, right? A really important piece of this is in, particularly in sexual assault survivors um, and rape survivors, People blame themselves for why didn't I fight? If the go-to response to trauma is fight or flight, why didn't I fight? Why didn't I push this person? Why didn't I, why didn't I harm them? Well, if your body decided to hard freeze and shut down, you couldn't. And your body was looking out for what's going to get you through this. Not what's going to be fun or easy, but what's going to keep you alive. So dissociation I see as very much a survival tactic like your body's ability to survive really horrific things. I could say a million more things, but I think that's a good intro and summary for today. Okay. Now, when I talk about exposure techniques in, in therapy, there's something called exposure therapy. There's also things that are going for the emotion. So we might have dissociated. We might have split off a memory. We might have amnesia to an experience. We might not remember the details of what happened or not even know what happened, especially if it's when we're young. And in, you know, really extreme cases with dissociation, we can even develop different sort of personalities, identities within ourselves. Some people will, you know, on, on social media and stuff and seeing people identifying more as plural and they like that term better. There's like multiple people living inside one body, like really with different identities, different genders, different stories, different emotions. Like this can get, I think, for someone who hasn't thought about this, like pretty complex. If we're experiencing things over and over again, 
our whole identity and worldview is going to shift in response to them. So exposure techniques are trying to get in there and bring up the emotion of the trauma, evoke things that have been repressed or suppressed or dissociated, connect with whatever's still alive in there from the trauma that we're maybe reliving, reenacting, looping back to emotionally through dreams, through thoughts, through relationships, through choices. There's a big strength in, in some of these techniques. And one that I practice personally is called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's become very popular. I use it with clients. And it's basically started with eye movements, but, but came to this foundational theory and understanding that bilateral movement, tapping in your hands, movement of your eyes, listening in your ears back and forth, tends to stir something up that allows us to access maybe some of these memories that have been fragmented, that have been tucked aside, that have been saved for later because they were too much in the moment. And we can bring them ideally in therapy. We can bring them to a place where we can address some of those needs, work through some of those emotions. Now, EMDR is often called a power tool. Really common to hear this. Even in your EMDR training, those of you who've been through it, you might have heard this. EMDR is a power tool for trauma. If you've been through one thing and there's this memory or this thing that's stuck, you might want to grab that power tool and go for it. You got a solid foundation, all the safety checks in place. You know, it might just be really helpful to have that power tool. Now, if the, it doesn't feel like there's a solid foundation or the safety checks aren't all in place, like I don't know about you, I don't use a lot of power tools. I wouldn't use like a, a chainsaw or a drill or something without, you know, or I don't know, what is welding? What do they call those things? Like a, a flamethrower. That's not what they're called. But like I wouldn't use those things without the proper gear, without the proper training, and without a sense that like I have a narrow enough scope that I'm going to use this power tool and it's going to fix the little thing. So what happens when folks have experienced a lot of trauma, complex developmental trauma over time, it's interconnected and complicated in terms of their identity and their relationships. And if you just go into that with a power tool, without having some kind of lay of the land, without understanding that trauma A connects to trauma B, connects to trauma C, connects to family relationships, connects to work identity. If we don't have some sense of that map and we go in with a power tool, what do you think might happen? And I just have an image in my head of like an entire house falling down. <laughs> like you go in to fix, you know, the frame on the front door and you don't have all the safety checks in place. And then, uh-oh, oops, collapse. And so it's not, you know, it's not a far reach as a metaphor in terms of what bringing in an exposure technique can do when someone has experienced really complex trauma. Okay. So EMDR is this trauma processing modality, this tool we can use in therapy, not inherently good or bad, but inherently pretty powerful. And so we need to respect that power. In terms of how it works, <laughs> You know, it's going in there, trying to get to the root of the trauma to bring that to light. If someone's response to something really intense was to distance from it, I mentioned that monster earlier, right? And you're like, no, I can't see this. I'm going to go out of my body. I, I don't feel any of it. And then we bring up, okay, let's go to that strong memory. What do you think they're going to do if we as mental health providers or people trying to help go get in there? Tell me the story of what happened. Let's feel the feelings now. They're probably going to do the same thing again. They're probably going to go, mm, nope. They might distance from you. And some of you may have experienced this. You have a, someone in your family who was in combat. They come back. You're like, tell me, tell me. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And they're like, bye. I don't want to hang out with you. And one thing that I've seen show up in research on exposure techniques like EMDR is researchers assuming or gathering that someone's okay or they're fine or they're better because they're not presenting with hyperarousal. They're not presenting with fight or flight, right? If someone's experience of a trauma led them to dissociate, to hard freeze, anything along those lines, and we reintroduce a trigger 
or a memory or an aspect of that trauma to them in efforts to heal. It is very common if it's too much too fast, which it can be and often it is in these cases, for them to do the same thing again, for them to shut down, for them to hard freeze. And then you go, how do you feel? Fine. I don't feel anything. And researcher takes notes. I'm just imagining a scenario. Done. They're fine. They're healed. They're better. But not feeling anything is not the desired outcome. There's like a common saying in somatic therapy world, like feel it to heal it. But we need to do that in a very supported and often slow and paced way with these big ticket items, with these really horrific traumas. One of our episodes this season, uh, which you'll be able to listen to uh, right away, is Megan Zippin, who had her foot on the Boston Marathon finish line in 2013, the year of the bombings. It's been 10 years, y'all. It's been 10 years. And that's not done. That's not fear that's been erased. That's not trauma that's been resolved, right? There might be aspects of it that have been healed, that have been worked through, that's different now. But there are a lot of these things that happen, and it's going to vary individual, you know, case by case, person by person. But I think when we say we can just check the box, six sessions of EMDR, you're good, you're done, you'll move on with your life in a totally healed way, that really does a disservice to folks who've been through horrific things and who are in a long-term, maybe even lifelong process of healing from a traumatic experience. So... I don't recommend EMDR in general for complex trauma and dissociation unless all those safety checks are in place. Now, what are some of those safety checks? A long-term therapeutic relationship, mapping of like, what was your family like? How did this experience or these experiences we want to target, how do they fit into your overall identity or, or identities, into your story, into your narrative? Do we have a sense of the relationships that were impacted. Now, we're not going to have every detail ever, even within our own minds, but we have a sense of the lay of the land, just like someone might come to your house and assess, all right, these beams are strong, so I think I can go and drill on the front door. I'm just going to check, make sure the house isn't going to fall down. When we have that foundation, the relationship, some kind of lay of the land, and some kind of specificity around what we're doing, what's the emotion, what's the particular time and place in a nar as narrow a scope as possible that we're going for. And typically with exposure and with EMDR, we're looking for that earliest and strongest thing. And, and I think with dissociation, doing that sometimes is too much and too fast. And we're going to also have Michael Coy on the show, and he specializes in dissociation in EMDR, which is a rare specialty. He's going to talk us through some of that as well. If we're doing EMDR as a clinician, as a client, what are some of the things that will help it be helpful if I have complex trauma, developmental trauma, dissociation, dissociative identity? All right, so we'll get there into specifics. But in general, I hope it's making sense as to why I wouldn't say EMDR, go for it. What tends to happen is people with complex trauma histories try EMDR this thing that's supposed to help that everyone says is the gold standard of treatment now. I did it. Everyone said I should do it and I did it and it didn't work. So I must be broken, right? There must be something wrong with me. And if you've felt that, if you've experienced some gnarly things in your life, some difficult trauma, and you've gone and done this technique that is celebrated and recommended, maybe by therapists, maybe by friends, maybe by research, and it hasn't worked for you, I'm here to tell you, it's not you. It doesn't mean you're broken. Every single person I have worked with in assessing their trauma history, their behaviors, their choices, their symptoms make sense in the context of what they've been through. It might be five years down the line that we go, wait a minute, I just realized this thing you do is exactly what you did when you were three. And your parents were physically abusing you. It might take time for that to come into focus or to make those connections, even as a therapist, but also as a client. And sometimes EMDR and things help us make those connections. But it's not you. <laughs> 
So I'm here to tell you that if a, a modality is failing, it's just not the right modality or the right time or, or maybe the right sort of structure and provider. And that's, there's a lot of moving pieces there. And I know when you're going for your own healing, you just want the, the foundation to be strong. You just want to sit in a chair and have someone help. And I hope that you can find that. And I hope that this episode helps you to find that and helps you to know it's not a lost cause. You're not a lost cause. If you keep gently showing up for yourself and trusting too, if something does feel like too much, expressing that, pacing, there is healing to be had. I've seen it, right? I've seen it. It's not always as fast or as pretty as we want it to be. It's usually not as fast or as pretty as we want it to be, Um, which is part of the appeal of these techniques, right? We like have studies and usually the studies have limitations in terms of, you know, you can't be on too many medications or have too many diagnoses to qualify. So We have these studies that are really clean and clear, but life is not a research lab, right? And so we can't always compare ourselves to that. And it's really important, I would just say, that you trust yourself and trust in your capacity to heal slowly over time. I want to underscore one more thing, which is just what's problematic about encouraging people to tell their story. Here's one of the clips I'm talking about from the episode. So the thing to embed in your mind is that recognition of the early traumatic or fearful event in detail over and over is key to forming a new non-traumatic association with that event or person. A detailed recounting of the traumatic and fearful events is absolutely essential in order to get the positive effects of prolonged exposure, cognitive processing, and cognitive behavioral therapy. I gave the example of a combat veteran returning from combat, going back home. There's all kinds of ways that that can be really challenging to readjust. But again, if the thing that happened was traumatic, it's kind of by definition, too much emotion, too much too fast. Whether we went into fight or flight or a hard freeze, there was a big body reaction. There's a lot of intensity there. So when we as well-meaning friends, family say, tell me your story. It'll help. It'll help you heal. We're kind of doing an exposure thing, right? We're going, let's go there. Let's go there. And and their bodies and the symptoms usually are trying to do the opposite. They're trying to not go there. So what's safer is to build a relationship and rapport and to make it possible. We can talk about it if you want. You want to go there today? No? Okay, let's go for a walk to stay with that person. Because if your agenda is tell the story, tell the story, and they're not in a place for that, like I said, they're going to, they'll push you away with the avoidance of the intense stimuli of the trauma. So my shift on what Huberman suggested, which is the research says telling your story is helpful at a certain point, right? Timing is really important. Relationship is really important. And instead of thinking of going into the trauma again, the big reframe I want to share today is, can we build a space around this person relationally, physically, that feels safer than whatever they went through, shifts their physiology in a way where their body at a really deep level can go, okay, I think I'm all right now. And their body can assess, you're also maybe a safe person that I can say, how I felt. I can say one thing that keeps coming back to me that's really painful. And I can kind of, you know, give some air to pieces of this and test it out. So rather than going in there and trying to get the narrative and get, you know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about, I mean, two therapists as parents over here, they wanted to talk about everything. I was like, please, Lord, yell at me, like do something else. I don't want to talk about it. I'm young. I don't have the expressive capacity. (laughs) So not just for that reason, but for all the reasons I'm sharing, if someone doesn't want to talk, let's respect that. Let's know that there is a lot of energy and potentially a lot of value in this story. And there's also many ways for that to come out. It can come out verbally. It can come out through art. It can process through movement. You know, for some people, meditation or hypnosis, these different tools can really serve. So I hope I've outlined how exposure and how telling the story might make things worse. It's like going through your house and saying, I want to clean everything and just taking everything off the shelves at once. 
all your clothes, all your books, all your furniture, pile it all in the street and then trying to reorganize. We all intuitively, I don't, I doubt anyone's done that. Even like Marie Kondo, right? She says, just do the books, then just do the clothes. And even that, honestly, a little bit overwhelming for me. I'm like, all my clothes on the bed? I don't know. I don't know. I might like go into avoidance mode. They might stay there for a week. I'll sleep on the couch and then I'll put them all back and be like, forget it. So same thing. If there's a big mess, like if we think of this as a a really complicated closet, can you just pay attention to the jackets one day? Can you just clear one shelf another day? Can you just touch the doorknob one day and be like, I hear you closet, (laughs) like you're full of stuff. And today's not the day because I got a packed schedule and I don't have space for it. Same thing when we have, you know, a closet or a bucket or a well of intense emotion from an experience. So telling the story, doing exposure might be helpful. Time and place matter. Context matter. Being dissociation informed really, really matters. Dissociation is like in the DSM diagnosis for PTSD at this point. There's a dissociative subtype. It's integrated. We're aware this is a thing. So we can't just go, oh, yeah, we won't talk about that. We'll just dissociate from dissociation and leave it over there. We don't want to do that because we're doing the most disservice to the people who are having the hardest time or have been through the most horrific and life-threatening experiences. So if you're someone who's been through things, most people have, and you're not feeling, you're like, yes, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not ready for EMDR. EMDR was too much. Then what do you do, right? And I would just say, start with that foundation of safety. Start with that foundation of care. Okay. And start with building relationships that feel safe. Yeah. And from there, you can build a foundation where healing sort of naturally starts to bubble up from the surface, where it's doable to process the amount that comes up on this day. It's totally possible. And just the more we go at it, you know, with this fire and intensity and going for it, the more it sort of runs away. So think about it in a gentle way, in an ongoing way, in a habitual way. I think that's going to be what's more helpful. And look for support. People say, do you, should I go to therapy? I'm like, well, do you want to do it with support or without support? Find supports that are going to help you build a stable ground, that are going to help you feel more safe and soothed and secure and reassured. And then when you're ready, take a little piece at a time. And that might be bringing it to therapy. That might be doing movement. That could, you know, there's all kinds of different pathways and trajectories. And I think a lot of the other episodes um, speak to those. So I just always come back to support, always come back to care and really come back to, like I said earlier, the folks who tend to do well with these types of exposure based interventions have a warm, fuzzy, for the most part, cozy childhood and have long term relationships that feel helpful and have certain thoughts or ideas about themselves or the world that serve them. And so building those foundations can be so valuable and is worth even years of work in therapy. So don't feel like you have to rush. And if you're feeling a little bit shook up, like even today in California, it's a windy day and I feel like everyone's kind of shook up. Like just go back and find that shelter and find that support, find your center, find your ground. And then slow and steady wins the race. There's a saying in this work, I believe it initiated with Dr. Cluft and he would say, the slower you go, the faster you get there. So slow it down, take it easy, and just um, find your pace would be my recommendation. And listen to the rest of this podcast because, man, we've got some some amazing people, as I've said, people I respect in the highest degree. Uh, so I'm super excited to share them with you. And just to keep this conversation going, let me know how this lands, right? You can go to howwecanheal.com backslash podcast. We got a whole survey there to make it easy for you to write out your thoughts, or you can just fill in the blank at the bottom with questions, comments. You can also email podcast at howwecanheal.com and just connect directly with myself and or the producers. Love hearing your questions, reflections, and thoughts, and um, we can incorporate those into future episodes. 
So thank you so much for being a human in the world and enduring the things you've endured and um, being curious still and being here to learn. And I'm glad you're out there. And I look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Thanks so much for listening. My hope is that you walk away from these episodes feeling supported and like you have a place to come to find the hope and inspiration you need to take your next small step forward. For more information and resources, please visit my website, howwecanheal.com. There, you'll find tons of helpful resources and the full transcript of each show. You can also click the podcast menu to submit requests for upcoming topics and guests. I look forward to hearing your ideas.